So you had peace and freedom, and they were part of the People's Party in 1972 and 76. Ben Spock, the baby doctor that raised my generation, was the presidential candidate. And then Barry Commoner, the Citizens Party, 1980, our foremost environmental scientist at that time. Petra Kelly of the German Greens dubbed it the Green Party of the United States. But in 1984, we had our first national organizing meeting in St. Paul, Minnesota. I was invited to that for the Green Party. And down the road, the Citizens Party was having its last convention. And what we came out of that meeting was with a strategy to not get right involved in presidential politics. I had seen these three previous, four previous campaigns, Peace and Freedom, People's Party twice, Citizens Party. And at the end of the campaign, not much happened. So we decided we would go out, organize local groups, and get involved in local politics, issue campaigns and electoral campaigns. And we structured ourselves as a membership organ. People paid dues. They were represented in the structure in proportion to the number of members you had in your local. And that we did that in the 80s and into the 90s. And then uh, we started having our political differences. We had them from the beginning. In 1990 in Estes Park, that would have been the third National Green Gathering. We started them in 87, 88, 89, 90. It was the fourth one. We adopted a platform. And that led to problems because some people thought it was too far to the left. So they formed something. Uh, well, then the next year we formed, we went from being the Green Committees of Correspondence, this loose network to being called the Green slash Green Party USA, which was an awkward name because we wanted to keep the movement and the electoral activity together. And uh, the next year, something called the Green Politics Network formed, and they wanted to have a federation of state parties rather than, so the members of the National Party were the state parties rather than living, breathing individuals. And that fight went on throughout the 90s. And by the time Ralph Nader uh, ran in 2000, I was with the Green Screen Party USA side of things. Uh, but we concluded that Nader was bigger than both factions. So most of us in the Green Party USA went into the Nader campaign. And out of that in 2001, we came up with the Green Party of the United States, which represents our locals and state parties, not based on a membership that we all you know, are equal in, but on proxies for what's going on in the state. How many candidates did you run? How many votes did you get? How many people are registered in your party? Um, there are like 30 columns on a spreadsheet, and then there's some math at the end through a few columns, and you get a number at the end that tells you how, many, uh, how much representation your state party gets in the national. National Committee Convention. And frankly, it doesn't make any sense. The last uh, exercise that did our apportionment for 2020 radically increased the number of delegates from Texas, for example, at a time when the Texas party had dissolved. They lost their battle line. It's difficult to get battle line in, in Texas. And they had just gave up. Now, fortunately, the Republicans, for their own reasons, changed the law so one of those candidates got enough vote in the previous election, they made it retroactive and they got their ballot line back and reorganized. But the problem is uh, we have these state parties that some of them are frankly just paper parties. There's not much there, but they, they throw their weight around in the national. And then there are other parties that have, you know, a lot of stuff going on and they don't get represented. And then they have an accountability issue. So, Nader ran in 2000, there was a backlash uh, after Bush was installed by the Supreme Court and uh, a, a number of Greens pushed him away. So we were split in 2004 and 2008 between Cobb and Nader and McKinney and Nader. And our votes were you know, a fraction of what they were this year. Uh, Jill Stein brought us back with a good campaign in 2012 and another good one in 2016. And like I was saying earlier, our results are more about what's going on in the larger dynamic than what we're doing. So when Nader ran in 2000, it was an open seat after the corporate Clinton years. 
with Bush running as a moderate, the compassionate conservative. So he got the best result we ever got, 2.7%. Uh, the second best result we got was 2016. Jill had run before. It was an open seat again. And you had the two most unpopular major party candidates in history. The most unpopular was Trump. The second most unpopular was Clinton by favorability ratings. So it was a good year for a lot of people to vote green as a protest. Uh, and then I think, as I was explaining earlier this year, uh, we got down to our hardcore, which is about 400,000, which is nothing to sneeze at. It's something we can build upon. So there's so much detail to go in and, and I don't wanna, you know, I could go on and on. I'm gonna write a book about this someday. I was gonna do that instead of run for president, but other people had other plans for me. But uh, let me just wrap up by saying, I think we do well to go back to the membership model, both for democracy so that, you know, our representatives are accountable to living, breathing people, you know, that represent us at the national level. And we could use the money. We are probably the poorest party that's ever been. Um, and we depend on, you know, donations. And, you know, frankly, I raised more money than the national party did this year. 478,000, I think the national party budget is about half of that. And for a national party, I mean, we should have field organizers. We should have full-time staff that can really, you know, help the state parties. Um, so I, I think we, we should think about that as a structure. We should emphasize local elections and local issue campaigns and learn how to do organizing, not just activism. In other words, go out and talk to people and listen. They call it deep canvassing. You go out and listen, and then you can relate their concerns to what we're doing. And you can build relationships and trust. I mean, if we just go out and hand out leaflets and say, come to the demonstration or vote for us, a lot of people are like, well, who the hell are you? You know, you just showed up. We need to have an ongoing relationship with people in our community so that they know us and trust us. And that's how we can, I believe, elect thousands of people to local offices and from there to state legislatures in the House. And that's how I think we get a foothold. That's how the Republican Party, they got started with the Liberty Party, got a tiny vote. They put slavery on the, on the uh, public agenda in the 1840s. Free Soil Party, not as radical, but they started electing people to Congress and then emerged again with a bunch of you know, different parties and became the Republican Party. So Lincoln wasn't a third party candidate. The biggest caucus in Congress after the 1858 election was the Republican Party. So that was built from the bottom up. So I, I think, you know, given our political system, that's what we should do. I think uh, local elections, we shouldn't dismiss how much we can do there. Uh, local governments have a lot more powers than in most countries. You know, they, they can tax, they can uh, procure, they can pass laws, they can take over property by eminent domain for public purposes. So they can do eco-socialism on a local level, public power, public banking, public broadband, and so forth. And that's where we begin to show people, you know, how our program works in practice. And uh, one more observation, and that is, we're in a bad place politically at the national level. The progressive Democrats, once the establishment closed ranks against Bernie Sanders, made no demands on Biden. You know, when Bush was running, there were referendums all over the country out of Iraq. And, and the progressives, you know, were raising issues. And Kerry was pro-war, but, you know, he was getting some pressure. Biden got no pressure. He owes the left nothing. And you can see it with his appointments, you know, he's stuffing his cabinet with deficit hawks and war hawks. And McConnell's probably gonna be the co-president. So while we should raise our demands nationally and be involved in the movements, I think we can make, you know, some positive changes at the local level and show people we can get things done. And I think that's how we gotta build going forward. So that's more than history, that's sort of, saying what the future history should be, but I'll stop there.
Do you want to take some questions, Howie? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, uh, Zay, go ahead. Yeah, I just, um, I, I've been fairly frustrated with, uh, you know, the idea of getting involved with the movements since a lot of these uh, movements seem to be fairly, um, I don't know, shepherded or taken over by these nonprofit organizations who are <laughs> Democratic Party auxiliaries. And so um, I didn't know if you had any thoughts on, you know, how, how the Green Party should uh, navigate that, um, given, given that kind of experience. Well, I think we talked to the rank and file of these movements. They're much more receptive than the leadership, which is tied to the Democratic Party because their funding sources tend to be, you know, very rich people, you know, Michael Bloomberg, George Soros, Tom Steyer, and so forth, who are oriented to the Democratic Party. And so the leadership doesn't want to bite the hand that feeds them. The rank and file is concerned about the issues. So I think you'll find that's true in, you know, say the Sunrise Movement, you know, the leadership, you know, when I show up, they're trying to keep the rank and file away from me. But the rank and file is interested in what I have to say. Um, and the labor movement's a little different because they're funded by their own dues, but it's the same thing. You know, rank and file workers are interested in what we have to say, even if the, you know, the bosses and the staff uh, are oriented to the Democratic Party. And that's more, I think, a class thing. They're, they're kind of, you know, when you, once you become a union staffer or officer, you're, you're really part of the professional middle class. And that is basically the core of the Democratic Party, certainly its operatives. So there's a social thing going on there. So I think rank and file. And the other thing is, we should initiate our own movements. I think one big issue going forward should be rank choice voting, including rank choice voting for multi-member districts for legislative bodies so we get proportional representation. We just got one passed, a referendum in Albany, California. They're electing their school board and their city council by rank choice vote from multi-member districts. So the winning threshold, if it's a 10-member district, is about 10%. And Greens can you know, elect people in that system. Cambridge, Massachusetts has had that system since the 20s. I think uh, that's the kind of thing we should bring in. Rank choice voting is now in 38 cities and counties, two states. Yeah. There's a, a group called Rank to Vote which does have some funding. It seems to be sort of do-gooder Wall Street types, but they got campaigns going on now in 38 states. Rankthevote.org, check them out. You may have something going on in Kansas right now. And they're inclined to go for ranked choice voting from single member districts. I think we, in the legislative side, got to push for ranked choice voting from multi-member districts. And then we get proportional representation. And if we can change the rules like that, that's a game changer for us. Because then it's much easier for us to get into elected office and, and start making some positive changes. More discussion? Questions? Uh, Nathan and then da Daniel. I, I just wanted to uh you know, say that we're, ex you know, experiencing what you're talking about, Howie, with uh, kind of the rank and file of uh, some of these kind of democratically allied uh, groups being uh, unhappy with, uh, with uh, kind of the national, like us kind of reflexively backing the Democrats. Locally here, we've got uh, DS, the local DSA um, has, uh, group uh, has been kind of offended that the uh, national DSA uh, went uh, and uh, endorsed Biden. And they're just kind of like, we're socialists. <laughs> we want to back socialist candidates. And so, you know, I think that what you're talking about um, uh, is, is right, right spot on. Um, and uh, do you have any, uh, you know, what, what's your uh, take on, on, on DSA? Oh, I think talking to the rank and file where you can is a good idea. I mean, the chapters are very diverse. We got three local chapters to endorse us. Maybe another five, you know, gave us interviews and questionnaires. So we got a discussion going there. 
Um, some of the chapters that my chapter here in Syracuse, the Green Party is out in the community, it's working class people. DSA is on campus. And uh, they're kind of arrogant, you know, they kind of think they know better, frankly. Um, and actually DSA, they did an internal survey, like half their membership makes six figures. So they're kind of an affluent group. Um, I don't want to turn away anybody that's, you know, down with the program, but I think that's something to understand about them. But I think the young people in DSA, you know, a lot of them came into this through the Sanders campaign and, you know, they're not happy with what happened in the Democratic Party. And a lot of them, and I've heard this, are angry at Sanders because he, he, he didn't make any demands on Biden. He compromised on Medicare for all, a signature issue. And now they got no leverage over Biden. I mean, I think I put this in a tweet that the Washington Times picked up. You know, the appointment of Neera Tandon, who's attacked both Bernie Sanders and Jill Stein gratuitously, is a big F you to the progressives from Biden. Yep. OK, Daniel. OK, um, how is it that we have these raging fires out west? We have these, these worsening storms out east. Uh, how is it that the Green Party is not being identified as the ecological party? Um, did we drop the ball? How can we regain this, I, this identity? I think we got to do it at the local level so people know who we are. I mean, look, I've been working on what we call the Green New Deal since the 1970s in the anti-nuclear movement, the anti-nuclear safe energy movement. We had a group back then called Environmentalists for Full Employment coming out of the 73 to 75 recession. That was our program, invest in renewable energy to get people back to work. And, you know, we started calling it the Green New Deal. I ran on it in 2010. I mean, I tried to use that slogan before, but the Greens are, no, that's New Deal, that's Democratic Party. But then the European Greens picked it up, so I was able to convince the New York Greens we could use that slogan. And I think it's an effective slogan because it does appeal to those Democrats that think somehow the Democratic Party is going to get back to its New Deal era. You know, that's, they lost that 50 years ago. It's not coming back. Um, so, you know, in, in this campaign, I mean, we pitched to the corporate media, like around those uh, climate town halls that CNN and MSNBC did, that I'm the original Green New Dealer. If you're not going to put me on the town hall, at least give me a segment. And some of the reporters and hosts were interested, but not the producers. So, I mean, we really got blanked out in the corporate media. And we understand, you know, we know where, in New York, we know where AOC got the Green New Deal from. Her campaign manager, VG Ramos, was a campaign manager for a Green, Jabari Brisport, who now is a Democrat state senator, who uh, got it from me. And he ran on it in 2016. Wait, wait, 2017. Then 2018, AOC picked it up. And then when she brought it to Congress, she watered it down, got mm -hmm. rid of the ban on fracking and new fossil fuel infrastructure, the phase out of nuclear power, the cuts to military spending to help pay for the Green New Deal, and extended the deadline from 2030 to 2050 to zero out emissions. And then Pelosi never let them vote on it. McConnell had them vote on it in the Senate. All the Democrats said, oh, this is a trick. We're voting present, and they all voted present except four voted with the Republicans, no. And then Biden ran away from it. It's not in his platform, it's not in the Democrat platform. So the Democrats took the slogan, did some publicity and buried it. Ah. So, you know, that's why we had the Green Party. We gotta keep bringing it up and be relentless. But I think to communicate it to people, we gotta be on the ground. You know, like I was saying earlier, until we have you know, I said a caucus in Congress, to have a caucus in Congress, we gotta have legs on the ground all over the country who can carry our message. I mean, that's another thing the Democrats blew. There was a lot of energy on the Trump side. They were, they were knocking on a million doors a day for weeks. The Democrats were not until they sort of got scared in October and said, we better do some of that. So, you know, that's what we gotta do. We gotta be in regular communication with our communities and you know have our own media 
and you know be there at the movement activities and uh you know we i don't think we can count on the corporate media or even the so-called progressive media you know democracy now the nation the intercept gave us no coverage mm. I want uh, Malisha. Frank um, had his hand up. Yeah. I'm sorry, who else? Frank. I just got to pose. Okay, hold on. I saw, I saw Malisha first, then uh, Frank, and then myself. Go, uh, go Malisha. Uh, I just wanted to point out that Frank it was in the chat on Stack for a while, and also we're behind on time. OK. Well, we need um, like an extra 10 minutes. I would like to put a um, uh, a motion on the floor that that we extend the discussion for ten more minutes, since uh, we have a resource with us that we don't usually have. Um, well, it, it, a question I would pose to Howie. It concerns the way the uh, constitution. Frank, just a minute. I I just put a motion on the floor. Um, can we vote on that? Is there, Are there any objections? It's probably just the best way to do Is that. there any objections? Okay, seeing none, let's move on for 10 more minutes. And Malisha has the floor right now. Well, I was just pointing out that Frank was on stack. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Frank, you're on. St you're on. Okay. Hey, uh, At long last. The question I would bring up with Howie is that the way I would read and interpret the U.S. Constitution is that the original design was for the uh, vice president to be an active voting member of the U.S. Senate. And that was that way for many years historically. And somehow it, they got out of that habit. And instead we we're stuck with this majority leader who sets the whole calendar and prioritizes everything for the U.S. Senate. So, so truly, they aren't even following the original constitutional design of the Senate. And I wondered if you had any thoughts or uh, comments about that. I, I, I've never thought about it. Um, but I, am I echoing? No, who, whoever has the dog, just put yourself on mute. But I, I would say in general, uh, the Democrats have been too passive uh, with McConnell. The Congress as a whole has been too passive with the executive branch and the judiciary branch. I mean, there's the exceptions clause in the Constitution that says Congress can limit the scope of decisions made by the Supreme Court. Like the idea they can do judicial review and rule laws passed by Congress unconstitutional. It's not in the Constitution. That was an early decision. Um, and Congress has the power to legislate so that dealing with this right wing court, we can circumscribe uh, its power. We can also uh, shorten its power by say having term limits of say 18 years, mm. which means you'd have a new uh, justice rotating on and one rotating off every two years. There's a lot that Congress could do that it has basically deferred or abdicated in terms of its powers. I mean, Congress is the first article of the Constitution. That's part of the design. That's the most important part, because that's what represents us. So, but what you just mentioned, I'm going to go, you know, uh, do a little research on that, because that's an interesting question. I know the president, the vice president can preside over the Senate, and, and in recent times has been when there's uh, I guess to break a tie, but uh, if they got more power, you know, maybe that's the way, you know, Biden and Harris could circumscribe McConnell. Not that I expect them to do it. I mean, Biden's instinct is bipartisan and that's why I think McConnell's gonna be the co-president. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I, when I um, looked into the history of the Green Party, um, I guess I, I missed it, uh, even though I've been an activist since, since the 70s also. Um, 
and I started voting green when Nader, Nader was running. And so um, there is a documentary called An Unreasonable Man that uh, is made about Nader. I, I think everybody should go back and look at that, but um, what it what it showed me, I don't know, uh, I guess I was gonna ask Howie this question, um, is that, I mean, he was a very fine individual that had very, had the notion of public good and uh, even a, he even envisions a better society, but it, it's, I always wondered why he didn't stay in the Green Party and stuff, I think, because it, it brings home how as individuals, no matter how good we are, we, we really need the collective action of a party. We really need a political party that challenges the status quo. And I don't know, um, what's your experience with him, Howie? Uh, he, he's very helpful now um, with the party, but how, what is your feeling like? I, um, it seems to me that candidates running should be also building the Green Party. And then when you separate that, it's, it's hard to keep your course. And also I did realize watching that uh, um, documentary that they really did, the ruling class really did a, a workup on, uh, I mean, they're, they're gonna blame Ralph Nader for George Bush being the president forever. I mean, and that's part of the propaganda. Uh, it And they threw a pie in his face and Michael Moore and Bill Mayer um, mocked him on TV and uh, the late night shows and things like that. But um, in other words, I think he got beat up pretty bad, but that it shows we need the party unity and the steady building, like I think Howie's suggesting. I don't, can you, I don't know. To me, it was just interesting, but I, I had never seen that um, thing. The, well, I think Ralph sees his role as public citizen. That's what he was. Mm -hmm. And he got into presidential politics because he saw he was cut off from Congress, starting with the Carter administration. Got much worse with Reagan, Bush, Clinton. So he figured, you know, we got to go into politics to shake things up. Uh, now, he was supporting the Labor Party that Tony Mazzocchi was trying to pull together in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, before he agreed to run with the Greens. And, uh, and in the end, Mazzocchi endorsed him in 2000, which was a problem in the Labor Party because half of them really didn't want to run anybody or even a majority of them, you know, the, the late unions that were affiliated. Um, I think, you know, philosophically, he does want to see a strong third party, but he doesn't see his role as being the organizer of it. He's been very helpful to Greens Fundraising, he's probably raised more money for us than anybody, mm -hmm. uh, at least certainly in the early 2000s. Um, and, you know, this whole campaign, I was talking to him, he was giving me advice. Now, he didn't do a big public endorsement, although he did spend an evening raising $10,000 in a meeting like this. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, Ralph is like approaching 90. And all these young people are ready to hang it up and go to bed. And Ralph said, no, we got to raise more money. He stayed on for two hours. I asked him to come on for 15 minutes. That's who he is. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm in the process of suing the Federal Communications Commission under the 1934 Federal Communications Act uh, equal time provision. Uh, at Ralph's initiative, he's got the former counsel of the FCC to do the Head the legal team, Bruce Fine, who's nominally a Republican, although, you know, he was calling for, you know, impeaching Trump. Um, and Ralph is on both me and Bruce Fine. Get off your butts and get it done. Bruce has been busy. I've been busy. And, you know, it's going to get done. But Ralph, you know, he's, he's still very active. Um, and I would just say that, you know, I don't think, you know, Moore and Bill Maher, Michael Moore and Bill Maher might have tried to mock Ralph. 
it, you know, on Bill Maher's show when they got on their knees and begged him not to yeah, run? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they mocked themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought that was pathetic. Um, so anyway. Okay. So, you know, yeah. that's, and Ralph also promised his dad that he would always be a small eye independent once he had become this public citizen. And so I think that's part of it too. Yeah, uh, Nathan has one, our last question. Nathan. Oh, you got, uh, before uh, this discussion, we have had a little uh, social before the, uh, uh, before the meeting. And one of the things we were talking about was the wigs. And we've often talked about, you know, the Greens uh, being like the Republicans, it, it, like you said, in the 1840s, 1850s. Um, and can you just kind of sketch out your vision of several, what's the scenarios in which uh, the Greens, you know, take out, help, you know, or the impetus to take out one of these corporate parties? Um, you know, I think just like it, back then, there was a great moral crisis in the nation, slavery. I think there's another moral crisis now, and that's the climate existential threat of the climate crisis. So I think it's a very similar situation to me. And I think you probably feel the same way. And how do you, you have a, a bigger vision of, of how this could play out. Um, so I'd like to hear what, what, how you see that, you know, several scenarios that could work for us. Yeah, climate is definitely an existential crisis. So is a new nuclear arms race. But where people are feeling it is economically. I mean, we're in a situation now where millions have lost their jobs, their health care, 30 million people face eviction or foreclosure when the moratorium's end at the end of the year. 46% of children now are going hungry. People are lining up at the food banks. There's not enough food. Um, and I think the reason this, you know, racist populist right, which is based on scapegoating immigrants and minorities, you know, they want to blame immigrants for jobs going to Mexico. You know, the corporations did that. But because the Democrats are so pro-corporate, they, they, can't, they can't bring themselves to say that. Unless they're Bernie Sanders. That's why he was popular. But the corporate establishment closed ranks against him. So I, I think, you know, the, the class issues, the economic class issues, I think are the the issue that creates the wedges and the splits in the body politic. And I think what we've got is a progressive uh, response, which we have, which these progressive Democrats that think they're gonna reform the Democratic Party have pretty much the same, at least on the immediate demands. They're not gonna get anywhere. The corporate Democrats are like the corporate establishment <coughs> and they are gonna be, uh, public austerity, war abroad, and lip service for the environment, but not really do anything. I mean, you look at, go to the climate. You know, I said the whole campaign and looking at his appointments, I believe it more now than ever. Trump called climate change a hoax, Biden acts as if, it, as if it's a hoax. You know, with Cedric Richmond and, and John Kerry as his climate appointments. So um, I think what we wanna do is push instant runoff voting and proportional representation and elect more people. <clears throat> but I think we're gonna end up with really four tendencies. The libertarians, I think, have hit their ceiling. You know, the idea that the market solves all problems, very ideological. And while they're popular on drug reform and staying out of stupid wars, their market stuff is just not gonna go that far. The racist scapegoating, you know, the America first nationalism there is a base for that, and it's culturally conservative. So you got the evangelicals, you know, that they're hardcore. They, they're not that big a number, but 90% of them vote. And so they punch way above their weight. So you got that. You got the corporate center, which the Democrats represent. And we need a progressive party on the left. That's us. Um, and I think, you know, getting into the debate by getting people elected on legislative bodies, <clears throat> and running credible campaigns for higher office, getting in the debate is half of the battle. And I think we can win people over on issues. Um, in fact, I think the people are already with us. <clears throat> Just take a few issues. Over 60% of the people were for a Green New Deal. 
We were for it. Biden and Trump were opposed. Medicare for all. Fox News did an exit poll on election day. They called it government-run health insurance, figuring that would get a low support. It got 72% support. Biden and Trump were opposed. Uh, the job guarantee, poll a year ago, it's the last one I could find, 79% said the government should be the employer last resort. And then the, the Koch uh, organization had YouGov do a poll in September saying should uh, federal budget priorities switch from the military to domestic needs, 75%. I mean, our platform is the majority platform. So, you know, I think we just got to go to the people and explain that to them, elect local people and build up from there. But I don't think it'll be exactly like the Whigs were replaced by the Republicans because I think what, the way we'll get there is a multi-party system. And, and that's why instant runoff voting is so important. I, like I said, I think it's an idea whose time has come. And uh, there's a movement now for it and we should be right in the middle of it. Okay. Uh, well, we're uh, a little bit behind, but I'll tell you what. Thank you. We... Thank you, Howie. Thank you, Howie. Thank, thank you, Howie. Howie. Yeah, I want to thank, thank you. you. I enjoyed talking with y'all. And, and I want to invite you to, to watch our meeting and at the end, give us an idea of how, of, of your impression of our uh, group, if, if you uh, so li would like to. I would like to, but I have other commitments and deadlines that are pressing down. So I, I'm going to pass on that. But, uh, you know, maybe we can do it again. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you for all your time. time. Thank you so much. All right. Every, Every good meeting. Every first care. Thursday. <laughs>